Welcome everybody. This is Todd McPartland with iMarketing Leader and this is the training for this week and today is April 8th, 2014. And today we're going over uh, what I refer to in chapter 3 of my book called The Bribe and the Ladder. And it's how to build an irresistible offer and increase the lifetime value of your customers, clients, or patients. Depending on which business you're in, you refer to as your people who pay you as either a customer, a client, or patient. So you'll see, I kind of use those interchangeably and sometimes I put them all on the screen, but just know that I'm referring to the people that you're actually targeting when I speak uh, about the customers. That's kind of the generic term for that. So really, um, I'll get into this more, but you know, the bribe is the offer part of it and the, the building the lifetime value is the latter part. Let's go ahead and get going here. Okay, so on iMarketing Leaders, this is our R4 marketing system. And a couple of weeks ago, I went through the whole marketing system. And right now, the bribe and the ladder really focus in a little bit on reach, but more on the resale, obviously increasing the lifetime value of your client. You want to be able to um, really push them to the next level, get them to, you know, rebuy from you, get them to buy more. Uh, maybe you have a, a sliding factor and we'll go over what those that sliding factor might be, but maybe you want to move them up that ladder. So really we're, a lot of it's going to be focused on resell, but obviously with the reach a little bit with the bribe, depending on where you put your bribe, if you put it out on social media, uh, you could be doing a little bit of reaching with, with that. Say you had an ebook. Uh, you're, you're trying to give away or a book you're trying to give away or a discount or an offer, you could put that out on social media, try to drive them to your website where they would see the full offer. Uh, but really a, a lot more of it is really into the, the reach piece of it. So I just want to remind people that if you have questions, go ahead and type them in. I see a couple questions coming in. Just type them in and then when we get through this presentation, uh, this one's probably not going to take an entire hour. I'll, I'll have time for questions, and then I also want to show some examples, uh, live examples, if we have time. So as I mentioned, this is what I consider one of the foundational concepts, and it's actually chapter three in my book. And my book's laid out in, you know, kind of a sequential, you know, each chapter builds upon itself. So this, this chapter is one that you're going to want to build on later on. Next week, we're going to go over... Uh, sticky sites for sticky sites for sweet profits and that is definitely going to build on the bribe part of it so um, just wanted to kind of mention that all right so what is the purpose of the bribe or you know ethical um, bribe which is basically an offer you're trying to um, capture someone's attention right we have an average between three and five seconds to capture somebody's attention when they hit your website. So this is where, you know, we're really talking about the bribe. It's actually going to be on, on your website, but you have about three seconds when someone hits your website to capture their attention enough that they want to keep reading. So the purpose of the bribe is to keep the visitor on your website. Wow. Hey, pay attention to this. You might want this to read a little bit more to see if you want it. And most importantly is to capture some information about them. Most people do not buy on the first visit. We all know that fortunes in the follow-up. We hear that, you know, cliche saying all the time. If you have a visitor come to your site and you don't offer them something for free or for a discount to try to capture their information, it could be as simple as fill in, you know, a, a box here to get on our newsletter. Once they leave, even with remarketing, you have no idea who that person is or was. However, if you can capture their phone number or their name, then you can follow up with them. So that's really the purpose of the bribe is to get make someone a customer first, even if it's you know um, a very low cost amount. So what is a bribe here? I got some you know nice chocolate here on there. Everybody's pretty much irresistible to a lot of people, and it really is an irresistible offer. But what you're doing is you're ex you're trying to exchange products, information, a discount for some form of information. Again, for that follow up. It might be their name, their email, their phone number. Maybe you're trying to capture a lot of information about them. Maybe you want to know 
you know, where they came from, what state they're in, right? I mean, depending on your business, you might need to know some more information. The value of what you're giving away, the perceived value, and that second bullet point, again, it's perceived value. The, the value is in the eye of the person who's about to fill out your form or request some information. The perceived value must be greater than what you're asking for in return. So if you're asking for their email address, you know, we all get a ton of email, spam, you know, a lot of unwanted email, but we also get a lot of email from other places that we opt in. I know I get hundreds of emails a day of places I've opt in, other marketers or or other businesses that I'm I'm following to see how they're marketing so I can learn. So I before I would do that, I have to say, okay, what are they offering? And is it worth me giving them my email address? And maybe giving my true email address, right? Not just some, you know, fake email address. Is it worth them giving my name? Are they asking for my first name and last name? Are they asking for my address? Are they asking for my phone number? Well, maybe I don't want to give them my phone number, right? Are they asking for my cell phone number? Well, you know, people are asking for cell phone numbers nowadays. They want to be able to do some text marketing to you. So whatever you're offering, that has to be perceived as much higher. So a lot of the ones that we'll go through, uh, some examples like a newsletter, you know, everybody has a newsletter, right? Um, you know, a dollar off, five dollars off, ten dollars off. Yeah, you're getting a little bit better, right? But it has to has to feel and perceived to be more valuable, and the visitor must want it, right? You can offer fifty percent off, you know, dental cleaning, and if I land on your website and I don't need a dental cleaning. I'm probably not going to give you my information. Maybe I was just looking for a dentist for uh, later on, right, for six months from now. But if I don't need that dental cleaning right now, then I'm probably not going to give you my name and email address. So, again, it, the visitor must want it and need it right now, and that perceived value must be higher. So here's a, here's a, a common pr mistake. You know, it says, now tell me everything. Most sites try to gather as much information as possible you know first name email address phone number address state how many children do you have cell phone number the more information you ask the less conversions you're going to have so we need to keep that in mind now there's multiple different ways i'm going to give some examples here and on the bullet point use a two-step lead request uh double opt-ins follow-up emails after they first opt-in the minimum you want to ask is for an email address. Obviously, we want to be able to email market and follow up with somebody through their email. People are more likely to give you their email than their phone number. And most of us don't have time to go be calling every single lead that would land on our website to follow up with them and see if they're wanting to buy and what were they looking at. So an email is a very simple way to do that um, using any sort of uh, auto-responding email campaign. And then, you know, maybe you want to ask their first name because you know in your email autoresponder you want to say, hey, Joe, blah, 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 blah. Thanks for visiting. Thanks for filling out the form. You want to be able to speak to them in a more personable touch. But, you know, if you ask for the last name, that might be a little bit too far, right? Maybe some people don't want to give you their last name. So be very aware of what you're asking for in return for this information. So I want to show you an example, and this is from my own website. And this is an example of a two-step lead capture. So we're going to go over the anatomy of uh, a website more in t uh, next week. We're going to go over it a little bit here. But in the top part of my screen, this is what's called above the fold. And you can see there's a, that's my irresistible offer. Get a free copy of my book today. Right? So if someone lands on that, I'm giving them a free copy of my book. You know, it's a $20 value. There's, there's, I'm, putting that up as saying, hey, I'm willing to give you $20, basically, in a copy of my book if you fill out some information. Now, what information do I need to fill out? They don't know from this screen, right? So I have a red arrow showing you there, that big mouse pointer, that black, that's actually on the screen. So it's kind of like telling them, hey, click here. Um, but when they click on that, so get your free book, right? Oh, cool. Yeah, I want my free book. Of course, in the back of their mind, they're going to know, well, you have to know some information to give me a free book. Or is it a real book or is it just going to be an ebook or are you going to send me a PDF, right? So there's, there's some hurdles that I have to get over. But by just clicking on that, 
conversion rates, and this is what they see after that, conversion rates dramatically increase. Sometimes, some I've heard is 30 to 40 percent higher conversion rates when they went to a two-step lead capture than just putting the, the first name and email address on that first screen. So after they click on that button, this window pops up, and again, everything's grayed out. See, everything's grayed out, and it says, hey, get your free book here, right? And all I am is simply asking for the first name and email address. Now, you might be saying, well, is it a real book? Yep, I'm going to give them a real book. Need their address. That comes in my email follow-up sequence. So if I ask them for their email address or their address right here and their phone number and their company and their website, all this information that I want to know because I want to be able to, first of all, market to them. And then if I do call them, I can have some detailed information where I can actually have an intelligent conversation. I need to know all that information. But if I had a big screen here, where do you think the likelihood of someone filling that out is going to be? So all I'm is asking for the first name and email address. They click on that, goes to a thank you page and says, hey, check your email. Verify that you're human, first of all, because I'm not just going to send a book anywhere. And then as soon as they verify, they go to their email and verify it, immediately my autoresponder kicks them off a second email and says, hey, thanks for wanting a copy of my book. Obviously, in order to sell you or give me my book, I need to know your address. And it pushes them out, it gives them another link, and it pushes them out to another form where they continue on and fill out the rest of the information, their address, phone number, website, you know, other pieces of information that I want to capture. Now, here's the thing about people. The more they feel that they've already committed, they'll keep going. So just by the fact of clicking on the, that first button to bring up this screen, oh, man, I guess I already clicked on the button. I guess I should fill it out, right? And then they click on this button. Okay, I guess I'll give you my first name and my email address. And they click on that button, and then it says, thanks, go check your email. Oh, I guess, okay, I guess I'll go check my email since I've already gone this far. And then when that next email comes in, it says, hey, fill out the rest of this stuff or I can't send you a book. Well, that was the whole purpose, right? The whole reason that somebody wanted to do, you know, actually get this was because they wanted my book. So they're more likely to fill it out. No, they're not all filling it out. I get a plenty of people that fill out this part and don't fill out the address. Guess what? I have an email autoresponder that goes out in three or four days that says, hey, by the way, if you want your book, I still need this information. And I do that two times. And then after that, I say, hey, this is my final request for that information. I'll assume you just don't want the book. And then I just take them off of my list. But that's all built into an email autoresponder, which is in, you know, in my book. And we're actually going to go over it in a, in a future training of how to build uh, email autoresponders and you know which which one works best and in my opinion and other people's opinion um, so we'll go over all that but this just know that you don't have to ask for everything right up front if you build in an intelligent marketing system after that you can actually get all that information that you're going to need but at the bare minimum you definitely need email address and by the way adding the first name actually reduces the number of conversions but I like being able to talk personally hey Joe Thanks for filling this out. I'd like to really give you a copy of my book. And then maybe inside the email, I use his first name again or he or she's first name again. So I'm willing to lower that uh, conversion rate because I am actually giving away you know, a $20 book here. So it's not like I'm just giving away an ebook and I just want a ton of people on my email list. I want people who are actually serious that they want my book, that they, maybe they want my services. So depending on, again, what your offer is, if it's just a coupon, you may say, hey, give me your email address and I'll give you a coupon, right? Because I'm going to email it to you. So let's move on to where to place the bribe. Now, there's the, the overall main going, you know, kind of conversion, where does it work best, is what they refer to as above the fold. So if you look and when you scroll on a screen, and I'll, I'll show you some of these live when we, if we have some time here at the end. Above the fold means that screen that first initially comes up, what can you see on the screen without scrolling? Now that is a big difference depending on how big your screen is. It's even a bigger difference if you're on a smartphone, right? So those are all things to kind of consider. Now bribes on smartphones, you know, we haven't done a whole lot of testing to say how many people fill it out 
on a smartphone versus the other phone. I mean, if they're coming on a smartphone, they might be looking for directions, looking for a phone number. You know, maybe not going to get a ton of opt-ins. So maybe you want to put the other information up up uh, higher on that screen. Like, hey, here's the directions. Here's a button for the directions. Here's a, uh, here's our phone number. Click the call. Maybe not, hey, 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 here's a, here's a coupon offer. Maybe that comes second. So they might have to scroll a little bit. But we're talking on a, on a, on a regular old desktop screen above the fold. And actually, the right-hand side actually converts a lot higher. And I talk about it in my book. Uh, Russell Brunson did a big study on this where you know a lot of testing is done on split testing. And you have to have a lot of traffic in order to split test. But they did a test of putting an opt-in box on the left-hand side and one putting on the right-hand side. Everything else was identical. And the one on the right-hand side far, far outweighed the conversion rate. And his determination was, well, that's kind of where your mouse naturally goes. That's where the scroll bar is. That's where the X is to, to exit out. So your your eyes kind of start on the left and they move to the right and your mouse is kind of moving along with it. That's where we enjoy uh, and like to place them. Again, but it's up to testing, right? You're going to see some examples where people don't even put them above the fold. They want an image to capture the, that three-second capture. They think that's more important than the actual opt-in because again if you're asking for information you might be turning people away right they might, oh this guy's just wanting information so it needs to be above the fold if it's a really really great offer and you believe that's going to get people to stick if you have another attractive image or benefit driven uh, website then you'd want that above the fold and then maybe the opt-in below that or you can do the two-step um, request where you actually just have a button and you can easily put that above the fold because there's a lot of room up there. You know, an opt-in does take up some room. And then you want to make it stand out. So here in section C is actually where we're talking about with the opt-in. But really, B and C are the bribe, right? B is basically talking about the headline. You know, this is what people's eyes are first going to go to. Besides the logo, which is uh, depicted with letter A up there, they're going to go to this attractive image, bullet points, headline that stands out and then their eyes will move over you know sometimes you push arrows over there to kind of direct their eyes over there to say hey go over here and fill this out please if you like all this information go fill fill all that out so those are the main placements of the bribe let's go into and look at an example here that i put in the, the presentation so this one is book and, you know, it's a, a, a travel agency. So book a trip with us, right? That's really what you can see. You know, and then you don't really see that little bit smaller things because your eyes kind of move over that. And the next thing you say is win a $100 Visa gift card. So really win a $100 Visa gift card is the thing that's biggest, right? It stands out the most. And there's a picture of a Visa card. Then you might read, you know, book a trip with us. And then if you actually look in there and be entered to win a drawing, to win one of them, right? You might not even know that it's a drawing. Not everybody gets one. But if you're just getting this information and that's all your brain processed, the next thing you're going to do is look to the right and say, oh, limited time offer, win a $100 Visa, uh, Visa gift card. Now they're asking for the full name, email address, and phone number on there, and then let's book a trip. You know, again, with the button is very important. You know, kind of, you know, submit or next or you know those type words you know kind of make it fun you know what are you giving away you know let's book a trip on this one you know give me my free book is what i use on mine rather than just say submit right so you know, kind of play around with those do a little bit of split testing once you get enough traffic but you can see how this one is laid out you know get a very visual image you know very vibrant colors you know they stand off um you know the background of the screen was probably white on on the the rest of it so it pops out and you know put the big benefit of what you're trying to give bigger than the rest now don't go hiding this you know this is you know regular standard font size i mean don't put you know a little asterisk and put it really you know in the bottom void where prohibited blah 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 you know you want to be truthful you don't want to be tricking people to to fill out your form because then that perceived value just goes away so um, this is one example. Let me show you another example from a dentist. So if you're looking for dentists and you landed on this website, you would see a guy fixing 
yeah, looks like he's brushing his teeth. Yeah, okay. Oh, and then I circled here. You know, it doesn't really super stand out, but it does have the arrow. So if you were reading this, you know, again, here's the benefits, right? Bigger than the rest of it, because that's where you, it, this this particular person is trying to get the stand out. And then an arrow saying, hey, if you like this, come over here. Oh, okay. And then another benefit on the top. Okay, well, a 50% discount. Okay. You know, and I'll talk a little bit about this. Um, and I can talk about it now. You got to be careful when you're using percentages. A lot of people can't calculate those in their, their head, like a 20% off. If you just saw something that said 20% off, and we'll use this example, exam, x-rays, and cleanings. Okay, well, is that 20% off $100? Is it 20% off $1,000? You know, there's that value is a, a very fluctuating value. Now, in this example, they do a really good job because they say exam, x-rays, and cleaning, $150 for adults, $100 for kids. That's a 50% discount. So, you know, we can all double those numbers and 300 and 200. They, you, you, we can put that in our, in our head. First of all, I know it's going to be 150. I don't really care even if I knew it was a 50%. If I'm fine with $150 for an exam, x-rays, and cleaning, I might fill this thing out if I want to go to this dentist, if it was in my local area. Or if I was going to take my children there and say, hey, man, $100 for that. I know the last time I went, it was, you know, 200 or 300 bucks. But you just need to be very careful if you're using coupons or uh, any sort of other kind of type of discounts. If you're going to use a percentage, give them something to compare that percentage with. 20% off, $100 or more. Right? Okay, well, 20% off, 100 Okay, I might be saving $20. Oh, and then if it's more than that, I'll be saving more than $20. Or you can do the flip and you can actually turn around and put dollars in there. So this one, they could have put save $150 or $150 off. Well, that's a big number. You still don't know what it's off of, right? But if you said $300, save 50%, $150, now you're giving a lot of information. So when you're doing offers, uh, just be really aware that if you just give percentages, sometimes that value is more of an intrinsic value. If somebody doesn't know what that is, so they have to try to figure out what that is to them. Like if I went there, I might say, well, the last time I went was $500. So that's cool. You know, 20, 20% off. Someone else might've went and said, Hey man, it was like 50 bucks. My insurance picked it up. So I really don't care about 20%. So just, you know, kind of be, be careful on that. Now this kind of ends the bribe portion of it. There's, I go into a little bit more detail or actually a lot more detail in the book on this, but I want to give some more examples up here, but I want to get through the rest of the, the presentation here on the, the value ladder part of it. So if we have time, I'm going to show you some more examples. They're all out of my website, the ones that we're going to be viewing. So if I don't get to them, I'll at least point you in the right direction. We're about halfway through with the, um, the time we have allotted here. So the value ladder. ladder. Now this is, this is probably one of the most important pieces of the foundation that need to be done before you start, even while you're in business, right? You're just starting up your business. Maybe you've been in business for a while. You need to build and figure out the lifetime value of your client. Now we all have products that are cheap and products that are more expensive. And that is your, your value ladder. Your most expensive products at the top, your cheaper products are at the bottom. And the goal is to move them up the ladder. Right? to increase the lifetime value of that client. If they buy from you once and they buy the cheapest thing that you're offering, there's not a lot of value, right? Okay, one time, boom, okay. It might have been your intro offer where you didn't really make a lot of money. You're just trying to get them in. You know, So really what you're trying to do with that intro offer is you're trying to make them a customer first. You know, I heard this from one of my mentors. Anything that you do, you need to try to make them a customer. If you try to go pitch them your most expensive item, and they don't want it, you need to be able to quickly say, well, I have these other items. Any of these you know, interest you? Right? Don't let them walk away just because they won't buy your most expensive item, unless that's your business model. And smaller purchases are easier to say yes to. It's easier to say yes to something that's $29 instead of something that's $297. Right? Most of us probably don't even need to ask our spouses if we want to buy something for $30. 
start getting into that three, four, five hundred dollars, thousand dollars, depending on the price of of your particular product or service or information. And the sky really is the limit on this. You can build up your value ladder today. You might, you know, we're going to go over how to build one. You might be thinking, hey, this is my my top top of my ladder. And then as you start thinking about it, you start adding other information. You say, whoa, you know what? I could do this on top of that. So keep thinking, keep expanding. How can you keep reselling, right? It's always less expensive to resell to somebody that's already a customer than to go out and to attract a new one. So always be thinking, how can I resell? Now, obviously with value, right? You don't want to just be reselling a bunch of garbage and you know to, to your customers because then you will lose them as a customer. So let's go into why should we build a ladder. So in this funnel here that we have, there's a whole lot of people that might hit our website, right? And a certain number of those people will become our customer. How many we don't know, it's all based on that bribe, it's based on your credibility online, it's based on your reputation online. All of those different pieces will play into how far they go down that funnel. So the reason you want to build a ladder is because you want to be able to capture, first of all, the information like we talked about in the bribe of everybody who comes to your site. Now, you're not going to get everybody. People are going to, there's going to be a lot of people who aren't going to fill it out. But the goal should be, hey, everybody who hits my website, I want to offer them something either free or very cheap. So they'll give me some information so I can market to them and try to get them to move down my funnel. You know, meet me, know me, trust me, right? We know we buy from people we know, like, and trust, right? That's all in regular old marketing. It's in every every marketing book I've ever read. It's in every speech I've ever heard about it. You know, meet me, know me, trust me, know, like, and trust me. I'll buy more from you. So the more they trust you, the more they're willing to to fork over the bigger dollar amount. So with building out a ladder, if you know this, you know this about your potential customer, then you could offer those people in the beginning something cheaper, something easier to say yes to, right? So they can start to know who you are, right? They might be filling out that email address and then you give them something of great value, a discount or a book or an ebook or, or something, a video, and then through a series of emails, you can build that relationship, right? The next email out is probably not going to be a sales email. You're going to try to build that relationship over time. And depending on the different levels of your ladder, the more education and relationship building you're going to have to do before they'll trust you enough to purchase that one. There's go always going to be somebody who's going to jump right to the end of the, uh, right to the top of the ladder and say, I will buy your most expensive thing. Right? There's people out there that will buy anything or they really, really know they already want it. They've already been searching your you know, 15th or 20th website they've found and they really like what you, what you have and they're going to go ahead and buy it. But the whole purpose of building a, the, the, this ladder and this is to fill this funnel and to get people to drop out at different layers and different levels of this funnel. If you only have one item, and it's your most expensive item, and you're all at the bottom. Look at all these visitors, and then you get two. Now, you might be perfectly happy with that, right? Those two people, you know, if you're in a, a big ticket item, that might be twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000, right? But if you're in a small, you know, flower shop or, a, a, you know, a pest control or, you know, where the ticket items are really low, that might be, you know, a couple hundred bucks, right? We, we're not going to be able to live on that amount. But we want to be able to get these people into the funnel and really build build that through. So in building your ladder, so a lot of you might be familiar with the board game Shoots and Ladders. So this is kind of the way I feel about it. As people are moving up the ladder, you need to keep providing more and more value or risk, risk losing credibility. And what happens in Shoots and Ladders? You go all the way back down. And you might lose the game completely, right? If you if you break that credibility, you lose that trust on that first initial step after. You said you were going to do something with the offer and you didn't do it. You didn't send an email. It didn't work or 
the value wasn't perceived or you did a bait and switch, you're going to lose it and you may never have that person as a customer. But even all the way up your ladder, you need to keep providing enough value that they want to keep moving up. Now, they might financially not be able to keep moving up, but they want to. Right? And that second bullet point here, each step of the ladder should move towards someone who's going to be a raving fan. And there's a book called Raving Fans out there, and you should uh, read it if you haven't read it. But that's that top of our R4 marketing system. That's where the referrals come in. A raving fan is going to go tell everybody that they know about you, about your product or service. So each step of the ladder should move them towards that. Now, some people, hey, you give them something free, they might go tell everybody. You give them you know, a little bit, they bought something from you, they might go tell everybody. Other people, they're going to have to you know, build that trust a little bit more in order to, before they're going to go tell everybody about you and give great referrals. So just be very careful when you're building out your ladder, make sure you're providing exceptional value. And you really should be doing that anyway because it's probably built into your your product or your service, you already know your pricing model. You're saying, hey, if someone buys this one, they're getting a great deal. Well, if they buy this next one, they're getting a superior deal. And if you look at your business model, say, ooh, if you get this one, you know, it's, yeah, they're getting a little bit more, then you want to maybe put that at the same level as the one before it. So let's talk about building, building your ladder. And it's really about little commitments. So as with the the bribe portion of it, like when we're going over what's on my website, I was asking them for little commitments all along the way. First, just click on this button. Oh, then fill out the, your first name and email address and click on this other button. And then it comes to a screen and says, oh, by the way, can you go check your email? I really want to make sure that you're you know, a human and ask you some more information. Oh, and then that email says, can you click on the link in this email because I really need to know your address, right? So all along the way, I'm just asking them for tiny commitments. Same way if I ask them for everything up front, I'm asking them for a, a pretty large commitment. I'm asking you for give me all this in personal information, and you don't even know who I am. You just found my website. Now, maybe you were referred to me. Maybe you saw me on social media and you've been following me on social media, but maybe you just stumbled across because you found me in a Google search, and you have no idea who I really am. Even if you went through my website and said, oh, it looks pretty credible, you still don't know who I am. What am I going to do with your information? But all along the way, I'm building that credibility. Here comes an email address from, or an email from iMarketingLeader, right, dot com. They went on the website, now it's there. I'm telling them every step of the way exactly what to do. Now, the next step would be to get someone, get them to buy something, right? They're, no one's a customer until they've actually purchased something. You can't give somebody something for free and call them a customer. They're still a prospect, right? You want to get them to buy something maybe inexpensive, that's at the bottom of the value ladder. So in this little chalkboard thing, that's you know down here, right? Buying something inexpensive is somewhere in here. And then buying something more expensive, keep moving them up the ladder. Again, there's going to be some people that go right up to the top, but very few people. And you must follow up and resell in order to keep moving them up your value ladder. They're not going to do it by themselves, right? There's not going to people that say, hey, I just bought this ink cartridge from this company, and six months later, I remember to go out and buy that ink cartridge from that same company. They might not remember who you were. Depending on the, the lifetime of your product, it could be a long period of time, and they might not remember you. That's the importance of following up. You should have email series. You should have you know, a check-in point, depending on your product. If you want to see how the product's going for them, you want to see you know, if you're selling and on something on e-commerce, you want to say, do, do they get it? How do they like it? You know, those are those are showing that you care about your, your, your product or service. But it's also those touch points, that brand recognition, keeping that brand in front of them. So just remember, you must follow up in order to resell to build them up the ladder. So let's go through an example. And we're going to use a dentist example here. So let's say at the bottom of the ladder... We're offering a free teeth cleaning. So is that a is that a customer? No, it's not a customer, right? It's free. We didn't didn't make any money. You know, we make money. People are customers when they actually pay us for our services. So if the free teeth cleaning 
is not a customer yet. But what it did do is get him in the door, right? And a lot of dentists use something very similar to this value ladder to build incredible amount of lifetime value of a client. The next step might be, hey, two times a year, after their free teeth cleaning, they liked me, you know, we hit it off, if I was a dentist, and um, they sign up, they, they, you know, do an appointment for six months out for another teeth cleaning. So then they might be in that teeth cleaning one for a while. You know, they're coming in, maybe they're, you know, getting the postcards in the mail, you know, dentists are very good about following up, telling you you got to come in. And then maybe you're in there getting your teeth cleaned, and the dentist mentions, hey, have you ever thought about, you know, how do you drink coffee? Oh, no. Why do you ask? Well, you know, your teeth are a little bit, you know, kind of yellowing. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, <laughs> I don't want my teeth to be yellow. Oh, let me, you know, tell you about we have offered teeth whitening here. Boom. Just moved me up the value ladder, right? He gave me, it showed me a problem. Now, hopefully it was a real problem and it was an ethical dentist and saying, hey, your, your teeth are yellowing because you drink coffee or, you know, you don't brush your teeth or you, you know, drink wine or whatever. Um, and now he basically told me the problem and he gave me a solution for that problem. Oh, and by the way, I'm right here. I've already trust this guy. He's got his hands in my mouth, the guy or girl. Um, that yeah, yeah, I'd like to have that teeth whitening. Well, that's not an inexpensive item, right? That's you know moving up that value ladder. You know, a retainer if it's braces. Uh, keep going up the ladder. Cavities. You know, hopefully you don't have any, but if you do, that's a bigger ticket item to a dentist. You know, and then the dentist would keep filling this out all the way up to, you know, maybe it's orthodontist, maybe it's pulling teeth, maybe it's dentures, right? They have an extreme amount of items and not everybody is going to follow the ladder step by step by step, right? If you do the two time a year cleaning and a teeth whitening, maybe you never have cavities, right? So maybe you, maybe that's the highest you ever go, but maybe you refer somebody because now you became that raving fan. You have that dentist that everybody wants because, you know, he's great, he's friendly, and you already, this is your top, right? Hey, I had one cavity filled by the guy, painless, whatever, and you don't, don't ever need any of his other services, but maybe a friend does. So everybody's value ladder is different. I'm going to show you an example. You know, I have several different value ladders in my company, and several different steps within each of those, but here's just kind of an, a, a rough example. You know, to get people into my ladder, into my system, I'll offer a free book, right? That's on my website. This is somebody, you know, cold. Networking is a completely different thing. We're talking about somebody visits your website. They don't know you yet. So once they are, get my free book, you know, the next step might be up, you know, maybe a, a, a strategy session, right? Hey, let me, let me give you a, a free one hour strategy session where I can pick apart your business, find out about you, see if there's anything that you might need help with. Now to go from a free book to the strategy session, you know, they, they need to, to want my services, right? If they don't want my services, they just want the book because they want to go do it themselves. Then that's not a good fit, right? It waste my time and it waste their time. You know, the next thing kind of, and the, some of the lower priced items, you know, maybe reputation marketing, maybe talk to them about that. They see it in the book and they say, Hey, that's the foundation. I'd like to do your reputation marketing service. That's a, that's a lower ticket item, right? It's easier to say yes to than say maybe a full on website design or becoming a reoccurring client. So here at the top of this one, I said, Hey, becoming a reoccurring client, you know, that would be for traffic generation, uh, local optimization, you know, that's my goal is I want to have long-term relationships and, and partnerships with my clients. I don't want the one-off, hey, build me a website and, and then go away. That's very expensive for me to keep marketing for people like that. I want to build a relationship where I can move with my clients to say, hey, I can take you from where you are today and maybe four or five years down the road, we get to where I'd like you to be. But all along the way, I'm providing tremendous value and helping them build their business. That's my business model, other people's business model in the same industry that I'm in, they might say, Hey, I'm great with websites. That's all I want to do. One off websites, build a website, build a website, build a website. Now they might offer some other things, but this is an example 
of one of my value ladders. So now let's talk about your value ladder. You know, here are some examples of, of how if you get a piece of paper and a pen, some of you might be driving right now, some of you might be at work, kind of look at this and then watch the recording afterwards. But this is the best way to figure it out. Draw this little stair step, you know, and at the at the top you could put your highest profit or your highest priced item. I like to think about profits more than price because it's all about what you keep, not how much you make. So I like to tend to put higher profit items towards the top, even though they might be lower priced. But you do have to keep, remember, that value. You want to make sure that that person perceives value through here. right? If you're offering them something pretty expensive in here, but maybe your profit margin is really low, and all of a sudden you come and try to push them into something that's cheaper, it better not be the same thing, or they're going to say, well, why did you sell me something more expensive two months ago? And at the bottom of this ladder, so now once you've kind of picked your highest point, and you might have, you know, again, several different value ladders if depending on your business, right? The dentist has one, you know, he might have one track, the one we looked at, but he might have a completely different track for a child, right? Or somebody who comes in and immediately needs braces. Maybe there's a whole value ladder for braces, right? Upsell them along the way, you know, all the way into, you know, full-on set of braces and, you know, the whole, the whole works there. So once you know that that high high priced item, then you move down to the lowest level. And this is where I say offer something free, but that free cannot look cheap. Right? Again, we talked about that value has to be there. Or an inexpensive item, typically you'd like to keep it less than $30. That's for, you know, 10 to $30 people might spend that assuming the value was great enough to them in order to spend that, that that amount of money. But a free offer or a free discount is much more likely to convert. But if that's not in your business model and you can't offer something that you have for free or for a discount, then don't do it. We definitely don't want to go negative on a, on a free offer, right? We want to, you want to keep that, um, keep that profit margin. Now you might say, well, Todd, aren't you giving away a $20 book? Yeah, but the end result of a client, I know I'm not going to close every one of those, but the end result in the client, again, I have a budget for marketing, and that marketing budget, I have to make enough conversions along the way to make up for that marketing. It's just one form of my marketing. I might do direct mail. Well, not everybody that I send a direct mail piece to me or two is going to call me either. But overall, as long as that, that marketing piece was profitable, then it works. So if I had to, you know, give out 10, 20, 30, 40 books, and I can get a couple people out of that, those books would be just eaten up in the profits. And at the end, I'd have to look and say, okay, was that a profitable uh, year, month, you know, week, depending on what I was looking at. So once you have that, that free offer or that inexpensive offer, go ahead and start moving and filling in the blanks. And you might have to do this in pencil because you might have to erase this and start filling in your first product or service. You know, what's that entry point? Lowest level, again, that it's easy to say yes to. Do you have something like that? Do you need to create something like that? Or maybe you only have one product. Do you need to create a higher level one? You know, outside of mine, for example, is once they're a client, mine, I have you know, a completely different one where I can do personal consultation and coaching. Right? That's above being a reoccurring client where I'm just doing traffic generation. It's more expensive and it's more exclusive, and I don't do it for everybody. And you might have that same same thing. You might be able to offer some sort of other, more exclusive, higher priced item than what you're currently thinking about and selling. So think about those all on the way. Fill out those different pieces. Okay, that is actually the end of of what my presentation is. So I'm going to go look at. Um, so again, if you have any questions or anything. Fill them in here. If you're watching this on a replay, there's our email address right there, our phone number. You know, contact us if you got any more questions. If you like some more help on this, um, and let me go look through some of these questions here to see what I what I have. Okay, here's a question: How can I get a copy of your book? Great question. Um, you can buy it at any number of stores. 
Uh, it's on, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of online websites, and it's in a, a ton of bookstores. Um, Amazon is probably the most, you know, one or Barnes and Noble, or you could go out to my website. I just said, I'll give away a free book as long as you fill out all the information. So you can get a book one of two ways. If you want to, if you want to buy it or you want to digitally, you know, you can go out and get it on the Kindle version, or you can actually go out to the website, fill it out, but just know you're going to, you'll see my whole system, my follow-up system, and then you will eventually get a phone call if you fill out the information and then we'll want to take it to that next level if if that's what you want to do if you just want to get the copy of the book and walk through it take all the action steps and build it on your own that's one reason i wrote it so you know knock knock yourself out there all right question here does it matter where on the site the offer is okay this probably came in before i really talked about it but let's just kind of recap a little bit yes highest converting is above the fold on the right hand side you can experiment with it, but experiment after you've already tried the right-hand side above the fold, right? Start driving traffic, get people to come to your your uh, your site, and then you might say, well, a lot of people are coming, not a lot of people are opting in to the offer. Maybe the offer is not good enough, right? So that would be probably the first thing you'd swap out. Maybe the picture is not good enough. Before you really move that offer, you know, people have done this millions of times, and that's where the results came out, right-hand side, above the fold. Uh, let's see, got another question here. Can robots and spiders submit bogus info? And if so, is there a way to discourage this? That's a great question. On the two-fold opt-in request, you see a lot less, if not zero, spiders in robots. So a spider in a robot, for anybody who doesn't know, that's a spam that you would get where someone it's just kind of fills in some garbage information, some email address or some phone number, or some name that doesn't exist or is not real. They're just trying to gather information. You know, if you have an autoresponder, then you email that their system and you know programmatically they can go pick off your email address and now they can start firing you spam. Right? Or it just might distract you. Hey, I got this thing, it looks like Julie Smith. I call that number, it doesn't exist, or I emailed this thing and it bounced back. So that's a, a, you know, the spiders or the, the spam that this question is talking about. When you just have it on your screen, the, the way to discourage it is you can uh, put what they call a CAPTCHA. And you, everybody's probably familiar with this. It's the picture that has some words that most of the time you can't even read as a human. Well, that's really to discourage robots. But I will tell you there are CAPTCHA breakers, CAPTCHA, CAPTCHA busters programs out there that will break just about any CAPTCHA and they can still fill it out. But it does discourage the uh, maybe the more novice spammer, right? The, the more advanced ones are going to have the CAPTCHA breakers. They're going to know how to get through all that information. And, a, and is there a way to discourage this? So besides the CAPTCHA, what you can do is have your autoresponder kind of take care of that for you. Don't even be notified unless they've, you know, double opted in. They've They've verified their email address, right? You might you might get hundreds of requests from a robot, but maybe you don't even know that or care about that because until someone clicks on that link of that second email and verifies it, then your system might notify you, hey, somebody just filled this out. So that's actually called a double opt-in. Uh, a lot of people don't like to use it because they feel that it's going to lower their conversion rate. So you might turn it off in the beginning and if you start getting a lot of robots and spiders, then you, you want to kind of watch for that. Here's the thing I'll tell you about the robots and spiders. If they start hitting your site, here's, here's the good news. That means you're found in a search engine, right? These robots and spiders, I'm not talking about Google's robot who actually goes out and finds websites that don't exist. These robots and spiders are, are not recreating the wheel. They go to Google and type in information to find all these websites. So by the sheer fact that you're getting a, a, you know, some spam coming through means that you're being found for some sort of word or maybe a link from another website, right? That's the way they you know, kind of travel sometimes too is through backlinks. But that means your website's being found. So it's actually a good sign saying, hey, cool, you know, spiders are found. You know, spiders found me. But it is obviously a very distracting and very irritating form of the internet and we just 
all don't like it, but th so those are the couple of the ways. But that double, uh, that two, that two step one, it does nearly eliminate all of them because a lot of them can't, um, you know, they're programmatically doing it, so they're looking for certain fields, and then when they click that button, first of all, that certain field might not even be there. But even if they click that button, they don't know what that other field is going to be or where it's going to go. So we only have a couple more minutes here left, but I wanted to, to um, you know, show some some examples here um, of a couple different options and opt-ins. So right now you should be seeing my um, my website. Can you see that? So I make sure that it's coming through. Okay. All right. So here are some examples. So I pulled up a couple of them here. And this is an example for an auto dealer. And this is above the fold, right? I loaded this screen, but I haven't clicked on anything yet. And this particular um, template here has a slider across the top with certain pieces of information, let you know, and then business information, because hey, it's an you know an auto dealer or an auto repair shop. You probably want to know their business hours and their phone number. So that's more important than what's right below it, which you can still see, right? You can still see that above the fold, at least on my screen, a 15 inch um, MacBook. And then right next to that, you see email address and first name. So if you were interested enough and you, you stayed on this site because this was a compelling image and you know, maybe that caught your attention, click here to make an appointment. So that's, that's an offer right there, right? Click here to make an appointment. The next thing, oh, free car wash. And then you scroll down, and then you you see what that, that offer is. So this is one that's kind of above the fold, but it's not the first thing that you see. Here's a, a plumbing example here. So from this one, you, you can't really see any of it, right? Plumbers, they're a little bit unique, right? A lot of us don't call a plumber because we want to make sure we have a plumber in our Rolodex, right? We call a plumber when we have a plumbing problem. So that's most important to them rather than maybe you're doing a remodel, right? They still want that information, but it's emergency plumbing is, is a huge part of their business. So this one has, you know, a free shower head. This has a little asterisk with paid repair or service, but that's not the main portion of this one. That's really here, the phone number, right? If you're, if your bathroom is flooding, you don't really care about a lot of stuff. You want to find a plumber and you want to find them fast. So that's where that phone number would come in. Uh, here's a dentist. You know, we went over a lot of dentist examples. So again, this particular one is saying, hey, I think the phone number is the most important. Compelling images are the most important. This one actually has a background of a big tooth on it. So you know you're on a dentist website. It still pops out because it's a, a lighter color on the back. And then if you scroll down just a little bit, and you can still see it here, for a free teeth cleaning. Ooh, free teeth cleaning. I want that. And there it is. For free teeth cleaning, join this offer. Arrow pointing over. Right? Receive this offer. First name and email address only. That's all they're asking for. So those are a couple examples. I do want to make sure that we end on time here. So there are other examples on my website. I'll just show you where those are. If you go out under services, and then you click on the recent designs, slash demo examples. All those websites, they're actually live websites. Those are uh, example websites we have. And then I have a bunch of screenshots of other examples on here that you can click on them and maybe get an idea. There's a whole lot of businesses out there. Maybe it's already one that you're actually in. And you can get an example and you know kind of mimic what they're doing. Maybe not you know copy it exactly, but you know mimic what they're doing. So let's talk about what's going to go on next week's training. And that is going to be the sticky sites for sweet profits. So that's all about building a website and the most efficient way to build a website, get it to stick um, and really get people engaging on there. So if you're not registered and you're watching the replay of this, you know, I invite you to register. It's great to get uh, questions so we can interact on that. And um, I will uh, talk to everybody next week. Thank you guys.